Hello, I'm Ronnie Eldridge. Welcome to Eldridge and Company. In the past two months, 12 women in New York City have been murdered by their intimate partners. You'd think that couldn't happen here, but it does, and it's happened for years. Kala Ganesh is the executive director of Connect, an organization dedicated to making families safe and communities peaceful, and she is, sadly, too familiar with the magnitude of family violence. Welcome. Thank you. So you've been very active asking the question after you, you, you printed up a circular, 12 women and listed their names, and then distributed in communities and said, what will you do? <laughs> so what do we do? What, how, do how does this happen? Well, for one thing, I think that this still, even though it's in the papers every day, it still continues to be one of the least talked about issues. So when we go out into the communities and we talk to people and we do trainings, people still see this as a problem that happens between two people, not as a community issue, not something that's tearing communities apart, not looking at the intergenerational aspect of this and how the trauma from something that happens between two people is supported by community attitudes and how yeah. it follows It gets reflected in all the different institutions. But, you know, I think when people see it, and then, that, you know, a story about this woman was killed in a beauty parlor, which is what happened mm -hmm. on 30, what, 2nd Street in Manhattan. Mm -hmm. um, they look at it as a murder. Mm -hmm. And it's never, it's not put together as a package, you no, know? No. And that's what's so shocking about it. And I think most of the time when you read it, you always see that there are people who knew this was happening. There's either a neighbor, there's a family member, there's an employee in your workplace. Always there, is pe there are people around the survivor who know this is happening. But I think what they don't know is what they should do yeah. and how they should reach but, out. And also, they, they may know it's happening, but the woman frequently has already left the batterer and so they think maybe that's fine you know I mean traditionally we used to say well why didn't she just leave well even when they leave they're not safe well it's still the most asked question in all of our trainings yeah. and we repeatedly tell people that that is the most dangerous time for a woman is either when she's contemplating leaving or when she has left and therefore, the sort of the uh, gut response that most of us have, it's like, why don't you just pack up and leave, just come to my apartment, move into a hotel, I think is something that we should stop saying. First of all, I think only someone in that situation knows how dangerous this can be. Second of all, I think what we need to do is make sure that we connect somebody we know with professionals who know how to make this happen for her safely and not just to say, leave, leave, because that yeah. is the most dangerous time and that's when the batterers feel they have lost control over the situation and in attempting to regain control, they end up. So that's violence. why groups like, like Connect, and I should, I guess, tell everybody that I chair the board, uh, that's why groups like Connect are so important and, and need so much money, which the government is constantly uh, cutting. Um, but it's, Connect is, is a unique organization because it really doesn't provide, it doesn't provide shelters and it doesn't do that kind of thing. It does have a hotline for legal advice. But basically, it go, you go into communities and you do just what you're suggesting. You mm -hmm. tell as many people as possible mm -hmm. about domestic violence mm -hmm. and then as you said, you train, because you mm -hmm. run a training institute, mm -hmm. train different people mm -hmm. in important mm -hmm. positions mm -hmm. with peop other people what to do when that happens. So the two most important things we do are we work on the root causes of violence, which essentially means we have to involve all people at multiple levels in communities to learn and talk about this, particularly men and boys who you know, perpetrate, unfortunately, most of the violence. But we also have to look at it as an intersectional issue. Domestic violence doesn't occur by itself. We have to look uh, at it as it occurs in the context of HIV, substance abuse, immigration, unemployment. all of this, unemployment. I mean, a host of factors. And so it is situated in a matrix, race, class, gender, but within that, all of these intersections. And I think it's important to explore it in that way if you want to have a comprehensive solution. Not to take away from the fact that we continue to need shelter. We continue to need uh, services, direct services, because without that we cannot function at this point. But prevention and intervention must work hand in hand. And early intervention is something we really should look at. So right now what's happening is I think the crisis happens and then someone then figures out there's a helpline or someone calls the police, but the situation is already out of control. So early intervention, which means every single one of us must take responsibility to know about this issue understand about it, 
help educate other, other people about it, and join the movement. You know, volunteer at a local shelter, volunteer at a local organization, raise money for a center in your own community. And that's the only way I think effectively people will understand how to make this go away. And it's not just a women's issue. I mean, it, what you're saying is it's a community issue. If this violence is happening around you, it's affecting so many people, mm -hmm. and then especially children, mm -hmm. right, who then figures have shown sometimes grow up to be batterers themselves mm -hmm. and violent. I mean, we have we have record number mm -hmm. of violent teen violence, mm -hmm. don't we? It's on the rise. Teen violence is very much on the rise. Particularly, dating violence is on the rise. But again, the way the funding is directed, we treat all of these things as separate issues. Gun violence, dating violence, gang violence, child witness to violence, they're not separate issues. They're all tied in together, and I think we need to, our intervention programs must talk about them in that way. So in our work in schools, when we talk to the young men about the child witness to violence, about being that way, and then the kind of masculine exterior, the posture that they adopt, it's very linked. They're wanting to join gangs. And as Quentin, who does our work with men and boys, talks about it, the gangs often ask the same questions we ask. Are you, do you have food? Do you need support? Do you have a place to live? Are you interested, you know, what are your goals? And that's, those are the same questions that they're asking of them. So if they're not getting it elsewhere, and if our communities are not surrounding children with what they need, they're gonna seek it elsewhere. And then uh, what happens is, I mean, it, it, it also, in school, it's, um, it's so apparent, but is it really noticed and is it really helped? I don't know. Are you increasingly doing something with teachers and what do they do? The teachers are actually very much in need of help and they are reaching out to us asking that they be trained and they understand the bullying behavior that they're seeing as it is connected to dating violence, as it is connected to witnessing violence in the home and they are really thirsting for this knowledge. And I think there has to be a way that we can systematically provide this, not wait for a school to call us. So how, if, if you were inside the government, what would you do? Well, definitely, um, I think Department of Education really needs to look at this issue very seriously. Comprehensively offer this at elementary school level, middle school level, have girls and boys understand gender norms and how they're socialized, and look at it in that way. And I think if they don't invest money in that, this is not going to go away. And right. I think they'd really have to look at this. And when we talk to young kids, uh, what I hear from the men who are working with men and boys, they are so eager for this information and they've never thought about it that way. So when we, on a scale, we say to them, look, when you get up in the morning and you're home, you don't have to put on a you know, posture. You can be who you are. But then when they set foot in the South Bronx, they're heading out to school, they become hyper-masculine in the way they walk, in the way they talk, and what they talk about. And then some of them are in... The Celia Cruz High School, for example, it's an art school, and they can explore different identities there. And then some of them talk about when they're with their girlfriends, how depending on how the girlfriend is, they will either express vulnerability or not. And so when you demonstrate to them how they make these choices all the time, that they can choose to be masculine, they can choose to be a man in a different way, it is a revelation. I mean, it's something that they really you know, understand. Well, we have a system now, right? It, you go, if, if you're feeling that you're a woman mm -hmm. and you're being battered by your intimate mm -hmm. partner, mm -hmm. you can go to the police mm -hmm. and then you can go to the court and mm -hmm. get an order of protection. Mm -hmm. um, and then you have this protection, mm -hmm. but it's been shown that that's really not enough. So you can't blame this though on the police, can you? No, I mean, uh, you. Sorry, uh, you can't really blame anybody, but I think we really have to look at non-criminal justice responses as well to this issue because the people who reach out to the police, uh, the women who go through that process, first of all, are very, very few. Most communities, particularly communities of color and or immigrant communities, really don't choose that route. And we know historically why they haven't done that. And now with the anti-immigrant sentiment, they're not choosing to go that route. So A, I think we do need to strengthen other systems in the community that can respond to families. But New York City, just before we go further, mm -hmm. is not part of that immigration project where you, you The secure run, communities? Yeah, is it? But I think people are still, still being happens. asked. It still happens. And the immigrant communities now, the word is out, they get deported. So if the batterer is, you know, mm -hmm. uh, in jail, he's go very likely going to get deported. And people, you know, don't, women, 
don't necessarily want the batterers to be deported. What they want is really the violence to stop. Mm. I mean, they have children together, they have a history together, and that's not necessarily always the choice they make. Some do and some don't. And I think the reality is they just want peace in the house. And we have to work with that reality. And our on-the-ground research with about 400 or 500 people in New York City revealed that many, many people said they would like to go to the faith leaders before they're likely to call the police. And so strengthening the capacity of the faith leaders to deal with this, to take a look at this issue seriously, to really create safe havens in their communities and really build bridges with the secular community and service providers so that there is a seamless possibility for support for so these families. In, the, in your training institute, you work a lot with faith-based uh, religious yes. institutions and people. More and more so because the need is very high right now. Right. So we are working with faith-based leaders. We are training doulas who go into people's homes and who support women during pregnancy and childbirth. They are seeing a lot of domestic violence in these homes and they're terrified. We're working with them. We're training nurses. We're training school teachers essentially all levels of the community to be aware of this issue, understand the dynamics and the danger, but really become part of the solution. Yeah. So we're saying um, if you see something, say something. I know. <laughs> Except I, I that you have to know who to say it to, to say and it what to, and, to do. Yeah, and I shy away from that uh, phrase only because I think as an immigrant we really connect it to the 9-11 and, yeah. you know, and we see that everywhere and we know sort of my son, for example, would look at himself. That's who they're targeting when they yeah. say see something. Because yeah. so, he's somebody who could be taken off a plane because he right. looks the way yeah. he does. So I kind of shy away from that. But certainly the idea is at least reach out to somebody for help. If somebody, you know, and listen without judgment. You know, don't start saying leave, do this, do that, why do you stay? Just please listen without blame, without assigning any judgment on what they're saying, because only they know the complexity. And rather than focus on the survivor, we really should look at why battering is happening, why men batter and abuse, and that everybody else's behavior is really responding to this act why? of violence and this act of violence. Yeah. And it's so, for us from the outside, when you look at this, we really are not in a place to question someone's behavior, because women in these situations are constantly fighting to stay alive. And so they are juggling someone who could be violent, who could potentially kill them or their children. And so they're, you know, all their behavior is tailored around, you know, trying to stay out of harm's way. It's um, bullying has become the new the topic of discussion, but that's really the same. It's all the same, same. thing. And people because need it, to connect this. Yeah, it doesn't have to just be violence. It can be bullying that's very in harmful to So I think the government, you asked me the government question, yeah. I think they really should fund comprehensively, right. not bullying in one spot, right. you know, pregnancy prevention, right. and then you have a gang violence. I think they really should, uh, you know, fund comprehensive programs, and prevention money must not be cut. It is now cut, the state cut prevention money. Prevention is extremely important. I know in a time of economic crisis, we really want to do the band-aids, but we are going to pay in the long run. If we don't invest in our children, if we don't invest in that, in prevention work now, we're going to pay for it. What the federal legislation that was passed, what, what, did, they, what did they call that? You know, the big act of... Uh, the Violence Against Women? Yeah. And how is that funded? Well, that, I think it's just a federal money. I right. mean, the Congress allots a certain amount of money. And it just goes this. to different It groups. goes to different states, and through the states it comes to the cities. But there really isn't, uh, it's not become a habit. It's not become an accepted thing that smaller groups within neighborhoods should be funded, right? It's, I it, mean, Connect is a small organization. It's a small organization. And with, with a, a decreased size of staff every year because every of the year. budget constraints. Mm -hmm. um, but, and, you use, and you work with other small groups, yes. even smaller, yes. immigrant groups, yes. all kinds of neighborhood mm -hmm. groups and everything else. And there was a time when you got more money that used to fund those little groups yourself. Absolutely, absolutely. Because, you know, there are groups out there, when we approach them, people know that the population they're working with actually has these issues. And they would like to work on it. But they have no funding, no training. So we can provide all the training, but they still, still need funding to get something off the ground on that. We're also training a lot of community members now, which is really exciting because these are women or men who are not really part of the social service system, but who would like to do something out of their living room, who would like to do something in their place of work, and that's really exciting Are for you us. the only people who's doing that right now? I think who we're probably, <laughs> I think we're probably the only organization with prevention as a central mission, 
Uh, but I think more and more organizations are beginning to take on the idea of community-based prevention. So it, it seems to me that historically um, the police have been the agency, policing and the courts have been the agencies that get the most attention to mm -hmm. answer the problem of domestic violence. Mm -hmm. And what you're suggesting is, is this the term, I never understand the term paradigm, but this is this an occasion that we need a new paradigm? I think we absolutely Is that right? do. I Am think, I using it right? I think <laughs> <laughs> even if you aren't, we've just made it right. So I think that's okay. I do think that they have to look at that because I think the smaller community-based organizations actually know their community. They're trusted by the people. People go to them seeking help. And they're also able to bend with the needs of the community. You have larger bureaucratic organizations that are entrenched in the way in which, mm. and they can only move with you know, so much speed. But I think those that are there can really bend and sway with the wind and really meet the needs of the local people. Do you think the whole question of date rape mm -hmm. and then school bullying, we've talked about that, all come from an increased awareness of violence that can all be put together? I mean, it's not very different, is it? It's not. It's all the same it's all thing. The same it's just talked, I mean, it's just something, it sort of becomes fashionable, something goes off, falls right. off the radar. It's all the same thing. And I think in New York City in particular, this is very worrisome that because of the way funding is structured and there's less of it, we're all sort of positioned to have Find turf wars and we are really competing against each other. With the result, we don't have a unified women's movement in the city anymore. And if we want to stem the tide of this kind of killing that's happening across the city, I think we all have to come together. Whether you're doing reproductive rights, sexual assault, child sexual abuse, domestic violence, we need all to together. all be working together on the issue. So of how do we do that? Women. I think we have to start by getting everybody in the same room. And I think we made a small start last week um, when we realized that you know uh, women be being killed in large numbers, we put out an open call to the community. And we said, we're having a meeting at Connect. All are welcome. And we had a packed room. And there was a lot of pain in the room and a lot of energy to do something. People are feeling re-energized to go out into the community and stop waiting for when women to When you said the community, them. do you mean uh, people, groups like you, groups or, like us, are dedicated to these different classes. No, but also all the community members who have taken oh. our training. Oh, so I people see. who are not necessarily I in bet. the social yeah. service system. So people like that mm -hmm. came. Faith leaders came. Mm -hmm. Different people came, and I think we plan to really keep the momentum up, and to really continue doing community-based prevention activities. So we're very excited about the fact that people did come together, and once again, we want to build that uh, base in the city. You talked about gangs uh, with. There's supposedly an increase in girls' violence and girls' gangs. Um, are there figures and studies to talk about? To there, are, there are figures and studies, but I think we have to be very careful when we talk about, uh, about that to make sure we talk about it in the context of who still has power, you know, in the context of patriarchy, in the context of sexism. I think we still have to talk about that because the one model we have for succeeding is a male model. Mm. You know, and if violence, if men being violent in communities can get them somewhere, it's the model that we're going to follow. Do you think that so. the girls are, that the, 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 the young people who are parts of these different gangs come from, the, great, the most proportion, highest proportion, largest proportion of them come from homes where there's violence? Some of them do, and some of them come from neighborhoods where there's a lot of I violence. See. Yeah. So, not, I mean, they're all, I think, again, there's a lot of, People talk about the Chinese gangs now, the Russian gangs now, so they're all over. And I think one of the points that we're not looking at is the fact that when we wage war, when there's war out there, we see it being played out in small ways mm. in our schools. So when there was the, um, the war in Sri Lanka, the India-Sri Lanka, or the Pakistan-Bangladesh, or the India-Pakistan, all of those situations then distilled down to our schools. Isn't that and you have students who are young Does anybody men who are do they, in the Department of Education, they pay attention to that? Well, I, you know, the community liaison officer once kind of mentioned to me in passing, and I said, this is where you see the link between the larger context of violence and war and the, the idea of masculinity that it, you know, filters, that filters down to the young people in schools, and they enact it over there. And it's, it's an interesting um, dynamic because in some ways I feel they, f they feel free to do that because they feel very American. Mm. They don't feel that identity is under threat, so they're able to engage in you know, these yeah. kinds of uh, you know, issues. So is, uh, uh, how does social networking play a role in all of this? Does it? I think it very much does because uh, now we're seeing a lot of cyber stalking and cyber bullying and all the rest of that. And I think there's an erasure of private and public now. 
You know, and kids don't think about when they put something out that it's actually going to go viral, that it could go right. public and everybody's going to get, right. you know, that it's no longer intimate. But there is a blurring of that because I'm hearing from schools, connectors getting calls from teachers in elementary schools who are saying that children are very openly disclosing domestic violence in the home. And speaking just from my own perspective, I think growing up, I knew clearly what to talk about outside and what not yeah. to. And I think we were very aware of that. Yeah. There are certain things you didn't talk about outside, but children don't seem to have that filter anymore. And I think part of it is this whole social media piece that they engage in from very early on. Um, not to mention reality television. Do they watch? That. Do you think they watch television? Oh, I think they watch it Still. a lot. Right. Um, reality television now is a it's terrible. A sizable chunk of it is, you know, demonstrating women uh, at their worst, and I think it entrenches, re, you know, sort of this idea of uh, women as being shallow and catty and, you know, surface level and not really visionaries or thinkers or mothers. And then a lot of the stories are so violent in themselves. So I think all of this media piece certainly, you know, constructs how people think about themselves and children. Do you think the law and order SUV, what, what about that? <laughs> I, th I, I personally like that show. Uh -huh. I mean, I, I do think a lot of them are based on real cases and I think, you know, <laughs> Maritza Hardige, who comes out of the law and order, yeah. has done an amazing amount of she good, does. actually. Oh, yeah. 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 yeah, that's so interesting. And what about lockup? <laughs> I haven't actually seen that, so. Well, that's the people who are in prison. And, and if anybody oh, yeah. wanted an example of what it was like and why you shouldn't go to prison, they should watch that show because most of the people are such extreme cases. But it, it's so, in, you know, this is a topic that we've been talking about for so many years. It's, it's grown a little bit. It has grown. It's changed. There's a lot of things that have changed. A lot of services in place. Right. Government funding. But, but we've lost the grassroots organizing piece yeah. and the prevention piece. Right. It's, it's so, but it's also not been recognized by the government. Isn't it's that not true? Not in the way in it should be. I mean, the volume at which domestic violence occurs. The WHO said this is an epidemic. Can you think of any other disease if it's called an epidemic? The amount of resources that would be poured into it? And then and all the international, all the international problems that we have, yeah. the immigration, the trade, the slave uh, things, the, the trafficking, the tra and, yeah. yeah, and just even simply connecting HIV with the gender piece, not happening at all at the level at which it What's should be happening. What's the connection? Tell me what. You that. know how many women who are in, you know, don't have control over their sexual oh, life, I don't see. have agency yes. over choices, and you know, increasingly right. women in heterosexual relationships or marriages are getting infected. Um, right. with the AIDS virus, and I think people are not connecting that. So very rarely do you have, again, this kind of comprehensive look at the gender piece as it relates to each of these. A lot of money has been spent in Africa with the HIV, AIDS, and all of that. Countries are doing amazing does things. It, does it show a difference? I think it does. There are countries that are showing a difference. There's no question about it. But I think, again, it depends on how much agency the country has in designing these programs, whether we are, you know, like the trafficking, I mean, they're hard conversations to have and politically difficult conversations, I think, to have about our aid process and our control over the way in which uh, the money is spent and our, how it impacts our country's political relationships. And I think that's a difficult, yeah. you know, if you put country on list, if you say, if you don't do all of this um, with relation to prostitution or trafficking, we're going to put you on a you know, list where you're rated from one to five, and that'll depend on how we relate to you otherwise. It's going to go underground in order to get a good rating. That doesn't mean the problem has gone away. Right. It just means that it's gone underground. Yeah. In order for, so, so these are complicated conversations. And, uh, but I think as a nation, we do have to look at our relationship to violence. What does the United Nations do? The UN, they're doing a lot of amazing things worldwide. But I think they're not connected uh, in a con I think they're not connected in a way in which I would like to see them connected to the grassroots groups here. And I think the other sort of grouse I have with the international work is, you know, we see a lot of op-eds on women in other countries and the violence. Um, Nicholas Kristof's mm -hmm. great articles, and particularly on Mother's Day. Mm -hmm. No mention of the fact here. that 12 women were killed here in our yeah. city. No mention of the fact that sexual assault on our campuses is really a right. huge problem. No mention of that. So it makes us, you know, when you otherize, it makes you feel good. That's not to say that the problem is not there and we shouldn't be working on those issues. But at the same time, I think we should not forget that in our own homes and backyards, this, this is, is a happening. very serious problem. Yeah. And it's been exacerbated here with the large influx of, of immigrants. 
No. The, the problem added a whole dimension to the problem. It has added an enormous dimension. And I, I, I can't tell you how my heart goes out to, yeah. to, to, to immigrant communities, you know, coming from one, uh, knowing that people don't have the language, knowing that deportations are happening, knowing that people are terrified, knowing that communities are not supporting women in tri trouble because they don't want to bring law enforcement into the communities. You know, you talked about the police. They don't want to bring them in there because, you know, they're afraid. Um, and I think that's really... Um, and then if, when somebody does, um, just yesterday a colleague was talking about a Mexican woman who did call the police, and both her um, uh, husband's side of the family and her side of the family are now battling her, and she had to move out of the community because they felt she brought the police into the community where there are a lot of undocumented people. Uh. Same thing happening in the communities I come from, you know. So I, I do, um, the pain is really palpable, and women are having to choose so if uh, somebody wants to support Connect or learn more about Connect or learn more about the issues and everything else, they can go to the website? They can go to our website. We are at www.connectnyc.org. Connectnyc, one word, dot org. There's information on domestic violence, information on the deaths in New York City, information about what people can, can do. do. More importantly, what men can do in particular, what others can do. It's on our website. And we urge anybody who's watching to feel if they can do something in their community to really start. And invite, Please call invite us. Invite some people, call, connect. Uh, if you're a small business and you don't know how to respond, if someone's coming into the store to do something, Absolutely. call, connect, do all of these things. Find out where you can get posters, put them up in your children's school, talk to the school to see if they want to host a training. Talk, if you're working in a hospital, find out what and the process is. And connect will come there. out to any place and train. We will. We will be happy to partner with organizations, individuals. We'll come out and do what we need to do. Well, thank you so much, Kala Ganesh. If there are any people you'd like to hear and topics you'd like us to explore, please let me know. You can write to me at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016, or you can go to the website at cuny.tv and click on Contact Us. I look forward to hearing from you.